Hi everyone, this is lesson 30. Today we're going to be talking about the fiery furnace and the lion's den. I'll read the introduction at the top of page 110. God's people were now living in a foreign land. The Babylonian army had taken them from their homes in the southern kingdom of Judah to live in exile in Babylon. God made this happen because of the people's unfaithfulness to him. During this time, their dedication to God was tested, but God took care of those who trusted in him, even as he chastised them for their unfaithfulness. God remained faithful to his promises. We should uh, look at the timeline here. Uh, so now we're talking about uh, the period of time when uh, the, the Jews, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, um, were in exile in Babylon. And if you look uh, closely at the timeline, you might notice uh, something that, that seems a little bit strange. So if you look where the fiery furnace is, which we're going to talk about today, and if you look at where Daniel in the lion's den is, which we'll also talk about today, uh, you'll see that they're, they're um, separated in time. And in fact, uh, the fiery furnace even takes place before Jerusalem is destroyed. Uh, so it's worth mentioning uh, that there were people from Jerusalem who were carried off into captivity in Babylon even before Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, the Babylonians had come to Jerusalem um, a couple of times before they had, had destroyed it and had carried some people off um, to, to Babylon already. So there were already some exiles in Babylon before Jerusalem was destroyed, then Jerusalem is destroyed, and then even more people are carried off into exile uh, in Babylon. Uh, so that's just a quick explanation um, for why there are already some people there uh, in Babylon even before Jerusalem is, is destroyed. There were um, really three different deportations of exiles to Babylon. All right, uh, let's, let's read about some of those exiles in Babylon. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 30. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, some more good names to keep in mind um, for when you uh, are, are picking names for kids. Um, all good choices there. Uh, so, um, three faithful followers of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they were tested when the king of Babylon built a giant idol. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, they were young men who were carried off into captivity in Babylon uh, even before the city of Jerusalem uh, fell and, and was destroyed. Um, so they were there for, for quite a while. And uh, here we'll see how they're tested by the king of Babylon. Uh, regardless of the consequences, these men were determined to do what was right. So let's read that, Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 30. Okay, let's go to the questions. Question number one. After he built a giant statue of gold, what did Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, command his people to do? So Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this, this huge uh, statue, huge idol, uh, basically, um, and to, well, to demonstrate uh, his obedience to all of the Babylonian gods, and really to demonstrate his power and control over his own people, uh, he commands them to worship the statue. Uh, you will hear music playing, and whenever you hear that music, then you are to uh, to bow down to the ground and worship this statue that I have have made. Number two, why was this a problem for the Jewish people 
who were already living in exile in Babylon. Uh, read the, the first commandment. It's printed there on page 110. Uh, why would this have been a problem for the Jews? Why would this have been a problem? Well, the first commandment very clearly says, you shall have no other gods. You are not to worship uh, any other gods. You are not to fear or love or trust in anything more than God. Uh, God had commanded his people, God still commands his people, uh, to worship him alone. We are not to worship anyone or anything else. Um, and so this is a problem, right, for the Jewish people living in Babylon. God says, worship me alone. Nebuchadnezzar says, you are to worship this idol. Um, so what, what are they going to do? Number three, if the people didn't obey the king, what would happen to them? What was the penalty? What was the penalty for not obeying the king, not worshiping this idol? Um, you would be thrown into a blazing furnace. You would be burned alive, basically, which is a pretty horrific way to, uh, to die. Um, but that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar said would happen if you refused to worship uh, the idol. Number four, how did most people respond to the king's command? How did people respond? Uh, well, for the most part, they they obeyed. They worshipped uh, the statue. If the choice is worshipping this statue or being burned alive, um, most people said, well, I, I guess I'll worship the statue. And and sadly, probably a lot of the Jews um, did that, that very thing because they were afraid of uh, the suffering um, that they would uh, have to endure if they if they refused. Um, you know, maybe they convince themselves, well, I'll, I'll just do the motion, but I won't really think it in my mind or feel it in my heart. I'll just kind of go through the motions and that'll be enough. And, and that'll still kind of sort of be God pleasing. Uh, I'll find a way to compromise my beliefs just to get along. And, you know, that, that temptation is still very powerful today. Um, we as, as God's people are very often tempted to, uh, to compromise what we believe. Uh, to find some way to to give in uh, to this world, uh, to make things easier uh, for us. Uh, but, number five, what was the right thing for these believers to do in this situation? Uh, compare Acts 5.29 with the fourth commandment. You might want to pause and, and make sure you have a chance to read Acts 5.29, read the fourth commandment. Um, how do those two two things, two principles work together? <clears throat> All right, so the fourth commandment says that we are to uh, obey those in authority, all right? Uh, so the fourth commandment talks about uh, honoring your father and mother, and then the explanation makes it clear that this isn't just talking about our parents, but also others in authority. We are to honor, serve, and obey them, give them love and respect. And so when uh, the government, you know, in this case, it was King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but, but any form or, or level of government, when the government says uh, that you are to do something, uh, then you do it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you agree with the law. 
It doesn't matter if you think a law is, is dumb or silly or, or anything else. If the government says that you shall do something, then you shall do it. There's only one exception to that. And the only exception to that uh, is found in Acts 5.29. If the government commands you to do something uh, that goes against uh, God's law. So Acts chapter 5, uh, the authorities told uh, Jesus' disciples not to tell anyone about Jesus, never speak the name Jesus again. And in that case, um, the disciples said, uh, we must obey God rather than than men, rather than human beings. Uh, so if the government tells us to do something that directly contradicts God's word, uh, then we have the obligation to obey God, even if that means disobeying the government. Um, but that's, that's a relatively rare sort of situation. In every other case, uh, we are bound by God's word uh, to obey the government and to obey the government with honor and respect, right? Not even just doing what they say, but doing it gladly and joyfully without complaining, without delay. Um, and this can be a hard thing to do for, for some people uh, sometimes, but that's exactly what God's word says. Now, in this situation, the government says, you shall commit idolatry. You shall worship a false god. Uh, in that case, the right thing to do would be to obey God. Because here the government is commanding them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you must do something sinful. And so the right thing to do is to say, no, I cannot sin against God. I will not give in uh, to this. Number six, some people accused three of God's people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of disobeying the king. Um, what positions did these men have in the kingdom? Uh, you can take a look at verse 12 and then go back a chapter, Daniel 2:49. Um, who were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What what kind of position did they have? So uh, who were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? These were government officials. Um, I mentioned before that uh, there were some people from Jerusalem who were taken by the Babylonians even before Jerusalem uh, fell. Um, and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, we'll uh, read about Daniel um, here in, in just a bit. Uh, they were taken early on. And they were taken specifically because uh, they were um, uh, young, uh, promising, gifted, diligent uh, uh, people and, and workers. So the Babylonians said, give us the best of the best. Give us all of your best people, your smartest people, uh, your hardest working people, and we're going to take them first. And, and that's who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were. And the Babylonians took them and said, well, since you are so uh, gifted, we are going to put you to work as, as officials in our government. You're going to work for us now. Um, and so that's, that's who they were. Uh, number seven, what did Nebuchadnezzar do in response to the accusations that were made against these men? What did Nebuchadnezzar uh, do when he heard these accusations? Uh, he summoned them in. He gave them one more chance to uh, to obey him. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar was a pretty bad guy and um, doesn't get much credit for doing much good because he didn't do much good. But here, at least, he doesn't just immediately believe the accusations. Um, he, he calls in uh, these men and says, you know, this accusation has been made against you. I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to... Uh, to prove that it's not true. Number eight, as they stood their ground and refused to worship the statue, 
How sure were these three men that God would save them from the fiery furnace? So how sure um, were these three men that God um, would save them? Well, uh, they were sure that he was powerful enough to save them, right? And, and they say this to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, their God is powerful enough to save them. They didn't, though, know for sure if he would save them, um, right? Uh, because God hadn't come to them and said, don't worry, I'm going to rescue you from the furnace. They knew that God could save them. They didn't know if he would save them uh, or not. Uh, nevertheless, though, uh, they were not going to give in. Uh, whether they were thrown into the fiery furnace or not, whether God uh, rescued them from the fiery furnace or not, uh, they were not going to do something that was, was sinful. Number nine, what happened when the three men were thrown into the blazing hot furnace? What happened when they were uh, thrown in? Uh, they were completely unharmed. Not even a hair of their, their head was singed. And even more amazingly and, and wonderfully, uh, Christ himself came and, and protected them. Uh, suddenly, uh, they see there's a, a fourth uh, person in there. Um, and that, that fourth person is uh, Christ. This is Jesus. Jesus comes and stands in the fiery furnace with them. Jesus comes and uh, keeps them safe. A pretty remarkable thing. Number 10, why do you suppose that God protected them in this way? Note Nebuchadnezzar's reaction in uh, verses 28 and 29. Why did, did God protect uh, these men in this way? He didn't have to, right? Um, he could have allowed them to die in that fire and then uh, taken them to be with him in, in heaven. And that would have been um, just as good, even even better, really, uh, for them to, uh, to be rescued from this world, to, to uh, go to eternal peace. Um, but, but why did God spare their lives in this case, in this way? Uh, God used this to demonstrate his power as the only true God. Even Nebuchadnezzar realizes that, boy, their God has power. Their God protected them. Uh, this made an impression on Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, and his officials. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar never really came to faith in the one true God, didn't get rid of his other gods and, and worship the one true God alone or anything like that. But, um, but this did make an impression on him. Uh, and God did demonstrate his power uh, in this way. Number 11, you may not be compelled to bow down to a false god, but in what ways are you pressured to ignore God's commands? Just think about that. There's not one right answer here, um, but take some time to think about, um, am I sometimes pressured to ignore God's commands or to compromise God's commands or to give in a little bit to do things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, just just uh, take some time to think through that. All right, like I said, there's not one right answer here. Uh, we are all um, at times pressured in different ways in different situations to ignore or to compromise uh, God's word. 
and um, and sometimes the the penalty or the punishment, you know, is not it's not um, you're going to be put to death if you don't go along with this. You're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace and burned alive if you don't go along with this. Maybe it's just um, someone's going to laugh at you a little bit if you uh, refuse to go along, or or you're going to uh, lose a friend if you don't give in and, and do what they're doing, or something like that. Uh, sometimes the the cost isn't um, as high, but but in a way, sometimes that can make it harder because you know if if it's a big dramatic scene, um, you know, are you going to obey God or are you going to be executed? You know, in that sense, we might kind of realize, oh, this is a big moment here, a big decision. But when it's just kind of the the little everyday sorts of things, um, am I going to take a stand um, and get laughed at a little bit, or am I just going to kind of um, give in to my friends? Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit um, easier to just give in, not realizing uh, or, or thinking about even what we're doing. But something uh, that's that's good for us to be aware of and to, to think of, and, and maybe we're encouraged by the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to, uh, to take a stand for what we know is, is right. Okay, let's go to Daniel chapter 6 then, verses 1 through 28. Daniel and the king of the Medes and Persians. Uh, so, uh, while God's people were in exile, God eventually raised up a new kingdom, uh, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, or sometimes it's called the Medo-Persian Empire, to take over Babylon's empire. Uh, so, uh, while uh, the, the Jews are in exile in Babylon, Babylon is conquered by a new uh, superpower from the east, uh, the Medo-Persian empire um, and so um, now well let's let's keep going here Daniel who had faithfully served the kings of Babylon uh, he now began to serve the uh, new Median Persian uh, kings uh, they kind of take over the the empire the Babylonian Empire take over the Babylonian government Daniel uh, just like um, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego he had been taken as a young man because he was so gifted and, and he was put to work uh, in the Babylonian government. And so when the, the Medo-Persian Empire uh, conquers uh, the Babylonian Empire, he, he just keeps working uh, in the government. He has new bosses, so to speak, uh, but, but he is still kind of in the same, same position. Uh, Daniel's faithfulness to the kings was second, though, to his faithfulness to God. He faithfully served the kings of Babylon, the kings of Medo-Persia, uh, but he even more faithfully served the one true God. Uh, so uh, please read Daniel chapter 6, 1 through 28. Okay, uh, let's go to the questions. Number 12, um, a man named uh, Darius the Mede, and that's in quotation marks because most likely that is uh, just another name for uh, Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus was the emperor of the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Uh, so uh, Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian, uh, same guy probably, uh, had taken over the nation of Babylon. What was Daniel's role in this new government? What was Daniel's role in this new government? He was really uh, one of the highest ranking rulers in the empire. Uh, a lot of time has passed. Um, Daniel is not a, a young man anymore. He was taken to Babylon as a young man, but now this is um, closer to the end of his, his life, the end of his career. Um, and he has been promoted through the ranks and, and now he's really one of the, uh, the most important, most powerful rulers in the um, well, in the Babylonian Empire and now in the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Number 13, why were some of the other leaders upset with Daniel?
Why were uh, some of the other leaders, the other government workers upset with uh, Daniel? They were jealous of him, right? Um, here this, this foreigner is brought in um, and he starts at the bottom and now he's one of the most powerful men in the empire, really one of the most powerful men in, in the world. Who does this guy think he is? They're, they're jealous of him. Number 14, in order to get Daniel in trouble, what plot did these leaders devise? All right, so what's the what's the trap? What's the plot that they make against Daniel? It, it really is kind of in an evil way, an ingenious plot. So they think about Daniel. What do we know about Daniel? Well, one of the things they knew about Daniel is that he prayed regularly to his God, um, which says a lot about Daniel, right? That uh, his co-workers knew uh, that he believed in, in God, that he regularly prayed to God. Um, and so, um, because they knew that he regularly prayed to God, uh, they decided what they would do uh, is to go to Darius, go to the king and say, you know, um, it would be a really good idea. I think it would really help for, uh, for unity um, if we passed a law that, that said that all people had to pray to you alone, O king. Um, and the king kind of likes this, right? Because, oh, people praying to me, people treating me like a god, I, I kind of like that idea. Um, I, I wouldn't mind being worshipped uh, like a god. And and if we make everybody in the whole empire do this, you know, that, that will maybe increase our unity. We're all doing the same thing. Um, and so the, the trap then is uh, they know uh, that Daniel uh, is not going to do this, that Daniel is going to pray to uh, his God rather than praying to the king and they're gonna they're gonna get him right uh, they convinced the king then to pass a law forbidding prayer to anyone except the king number 15 what was special about the law of the Medes and Persians What's special about the law of the Medes and Persians? Uh, once a law was made, it could not be repealed. It could not be changed. There could not be any uh, exceptions to it. No one was above the law, uh, so to speak. Uh, not even the king could, uh, could change it or could go against it or could make special exceptions to it. Um, if it is written in the law of the Medes and Persians, that is exactly what has to happen. They were very serious about uh, their, their laws. Number 16, because the law was unchangeable, the king had no choice but to throw Daniel into the den of lions. Describe the king's feelings about this. How did the king feel about this? Uh, he was he was upset about this. He did not want to do this. Really, they uh, didn't just trap Daniel; they they trapped uh, the king as well. Um, he doesn't really feel that strongly about Daniel praying to his God. He doesn't want to get rid of Daniel. Daniel is his best, most faithful uh, official. But but what can he do? He can't change the law. He he can't make an exception to the law. He's trapped. Um, he has to has to do it. Uh, has to throw Daniel into this uh, this den of of lions. And uh, these lions, by the way, they would uh, put these lions in you know in this pit in this den and and starve them, give them just barely enough food to eat to to survive, so that when they threw someone in, these lions um, would be would be starving. 
and uh, would, would tear the person to pieces. Number 17, as God had for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, how did he take care of Daniel when he was in such danger in the home of the lions? So just as God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire so that the fire didn't harm them at all, uh, he protected Daniel in the lion's den so that the lions didn't harm him uh, at all. Daniel was completely safe, completely unharmed. And 18, when the king saw that God had saved Daniel, right, he rushes out to the lion's den. Maybe there's some chance that Daniel might still be alive. Um, and then he sees that Daniel is completely fine. Uh, he commanded that Daniel's accusers be thrown into the lion's den. These guys who trapped Daniel, these guys who trapped him, uh, they're the ones deserving of death. And what else did the king do? So what, uh, what else does Darius uh, do? Uh, he decrees that everyone should praise uh, the God of Daniel, the God of the Jews, the one true God. And again, uh, just like Nebuchadnezzar, he, he recognizes the power of this God, um, but it doesn't get to the point that he, uh, Darius, King Cyrus, that he um, comes to faith in the one true God, uh, trusts in him alone or anything like that. But he does acknowledge and recognize that this God, the God of the Jews, is uh, a powerful God. Okay, key questions. A, uh, when told to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's statue of gold, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They obeyed God rather than the king, and they were willing to uh, suffer the consequences, whatever those consequences might be. And B, where did Daniel find strength to stay faithful to God? Well, he prayed. He asked God for strength. God gave him uh, the strength that he needed to uh, to stay faithful uh, to, uh, to him. Okay, um, and then C, uh, how can we be a witness to what is right and wrong and most importantly, uh, witness to God's love by the way that we speak and behave. Um, well, we, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, we uh, can do what God tells us to do and be ready to explain why. Uh, if we refuse to compromise our beliefs, if we are willing to take a stand for what we know is right, people are going to notice. And yes, sadly, that means that sometimes people are going to uh, make fun of us or laugh at us or make life tough for us but other people will notice and and be curious why why is it that you're different why is it that you're willing to take a stand uh, for what's right and that gives us the opportunity uh, to explain well here's why um it's because of uh, of my love for god it's because of what god has done to show his love for me um and so that can be a, a wonderful opportunity to uh to uh, share god's word Okay, homework. Um, the first and the fourth uh, commandments. I think last lesson we did the second and the third. So uh, the first and the fourth commandments, please uh, work on learning those and um, be able to answer the key questions for lesson 30. That'll do it uh, for lesson 30. Um, as always, get in touch with me, please, if you have any questions or comments. Um, but uh, otherwise, God's blessings to all of you and have a wonderful day.